Yeah, so warning, my ending isn't like super polished because I uh, pulled this together a bit last minute. But um, So um, my talk is about my research for my master's dissertation about sex work in Argentina and Ecuador, um, which is based on some interviews that I did for my undergraduate thesis. Um, and I took a slightly different approach to it for my master's dissertation. Um, so a little bit of background um, about kind of the ideologies towards prostitution within um, kind of feminist policy approaches. So there's two kind of main camps in terms of um, views about prostitution. One is called abolitionism, uh, which is the belief that prostitution is inherently oppressive, and inherently violent towards women, um, that there is no such thing as voluntary prostitution. It is always done out of necessity and not out of choice. Um, and the abolitionist feminists believe that the legal solution to prostitution is to uh, criminalize the purchasing of sex, um, but not the selling of sex. So that's like the model that exists in Sweden and Norway um, and is often called the Nordic model. Um, so that model is seen as uh, not punishing what's typically seen as the women um, selling sex, um, but punishing the people who are using prostitutes. Um, and on the other hand, we have a sex worker's rights perspective, which views sex work um, or prostitution as a job just like any other job, um, sees it as something we should treat as um, any other kind of form of labor, and that the problem with it is not uh, the selling of sex itself, but the conditions under which it occurs. Uh, and they believe that the solution to um, helping sex workers is to recognize prostitution as a legitimate form of work and to de decriminalize or legalize it and focus on improving the conditions within the industry. So a little bit of background. Um, a major question within, uh, when we look at prostitution is whether or not sex workers can exercise agency or to what extent they can exercise agency. And I think um, that we have to look at kind of the conflict between an individual's choices and um, the limitations on the choices that they face in their lives. So we can see that um, any person pretty much is operating under different stru structural oppressions like poverty, sexism, racism, transphobia, homophobia. Um, but at the same time within their lives, they can exercise individual choices. So a sex worker might be living under conditions of poverty or discrimination, um, but at the same time has different choices within their lives. So they might be able to choose to do domestic work, or they might be able to choose to work in food service, um, or they may get married and rely on their partner's income, or they may be able to choose to do sex work. And so an individual person we can see is examining the different options available to them within their lives and choosing among them what they decide is the best one. And we're all going to do this too when we go and graduate from here and we have, say, the option to go into consulting and make a lot of money or maybe we're going to go take a really low paid job for a nonprofit but f get a lot of personal fulfillment from that or maybe we're going to go um, travel for a while and find ourselves, right? Um, so we have different limitations on our ability to choose in that like we need to make money and be able to eat um, but at the same time, we want to do something that's fulfilling to us. And so I think we can see this as sort of a spectrum of agency in that different people have different levels of constraint on their choice. So we may be very lucky that we're in a place where we have a lot of choices and um, a lot of opportunities available to us, but someone with less money may have less ability to choose um, and less agency available to them. So I kind of see this as operating from absolutely no agency, which might be a person who's uh, in a condition of sex trafficking, that they're being held against their will, um, they have no option to leave uh, prostitution, and someone is forcing them with violence to remain in it, to someone with complete agency who has plenty of different job opportunities available to them, but they say, you know what, I really like selling sex, and this is what I want to do. Uh, and I think we can see most sex workers is operating somewhere in between those two extremes. So they may have some level of economic need, but at the same time have some other options available to them, other types of low-income jobs, um, and end up doing sex work because they assess it as the best option available to them. 
So my question is about how do sex workers themselves feel about selling sex? Because I think it's really important to understand how much agency sex workers have uh, and ultimately understand how we should view prostitution to understand how sex workers themselves view their own lives and their own decisions to sell sex. Uh, and to understand this, we need to look at sex workers' subjectivities. So subjectivity is a concept um, that looks at a subject's inner life, their emotions, um, and basically how society and the social influences an individual's personal experiences of emotion and how they internalize social norms, social pressures, and then respond to them at the same time. Um, so it is what Lorman has called the emotional experience of a political subject um, and a person, how they position themselves within society and come to see themselves. Um, basically how the individual is interacting with society. And so um, sex workers may have a wide variety of feelings about selling sex and some of the literature suggests um, that some of these emotions can be conflicting. So they may um, have both shame and pride about selling sex in that they feel it's a shameful thing to be a prostitute or maybe they have religious beliefs that prostitution is wrong but at the same time they feel pride about their ability to earn an income, their ability to provide for their families and their children. Um, they may feel fear about uh, violence that they may experience from clients, but at the same time, the income from sex work might provide them stability in their lives that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and there's a lot of also conflict within the literature about uh, whether sex workers can experience sexual pleasure within sex work and uh, some findings that there are certain sex workers who do get sexual pleasure out of their in relations with clients, while there's others who find it completely re revolting, disgusting, and say, no, I would absolutely never find pleasure out of it. Um, so the literature suggests that there's a lot of uh, conflicting and diverse experiences of sex work that can't easily be put into a box. So my methods um, were I traveled to both Buenos Aires, Argentina, and to multiple cities within Ecuador and conducted personal interviews with sex workers there. So in Buenos Aires, I conducted interviews with 41 sex workers in a couple different parts of the city. Most of them were women, um, cisgender women, meaning that they're not transgender, um, three transgender women and four cisgender men. And most of my interviews occurred in kind of the upper class area of the city, um, but with mostly street sex workers. Um, so in this area in the center of the city, um, which is kind of like a businessy, touristy district. Um, and uh, t I did 10 interviews in Once or Balvanera, which was a bit of a lower income, um, mostly immigrant type of neighborhood. And there's a few neighborhoods that I have starred here, Flores, um, Constitucion, where there's a lot of prostitution that happens, but I couldn't go there, unfortunately, due to safety issues. Because people told me, like, don't go there even during the day, it's really unsafe. So if I had been able to do interviews there, the experiences of people that I talked to may have been a bit different. And also most of my interviews were with street sex workers. So if I had done more interviews with indoor sex workers or people working on um, through the internet, the responses I got may have been fairly different. So keep that in mind as a limitation of my study. Um, I also conducted interviews with the National Sex Workers Union of Argentina called AMAR, um, which is associated with the um, one of the national workers unions and fights or works towards getting sex work to be recognized as work by the government. And then at the same time I interviewed um, another group that split off from AMAR, the sex workers union, um, called AMAD, the Association, uh, the Association of Argentine Women for Human Rights, which was formerly a part of the sex workers union but split off from them because they disagreed with the concept of prostitution as work and they um, take an abolitionist feminist perspective. They fight to help um, other prostitutes to leave prostitution and find other jobs because they see it as exploitative. Um, now, both of those organizations are run entirely by people who are currently or were formerly in prostitution. And then I also conducted some interviews with anti-trafficking organizations there. And um, one of the networks of Latin American um, sex workers organizations of which there are two in Latin America, Red Trasex, one which is based in Buenos Aires, and coincidentally, the other one is based in Ecuador, um, which just worked out really well. I didn't plan it that way. 
And then in Ecuador, I conducted interviews with 47 sex workers in four different cities. I was mostly based in Quito, um, and I also got to travel to Guayaquil and Machala, and then a small town called Milagro. Um, again, most of my um, interviews were with <coughs> uh, female sex workers, but I got to interview a, a substantial number of transgender women um, and cisgender men as well. And uh, Ecuador is a really interesting country for studying sex work because it was the first country in Latin America where sex workers began organizing themselves in Machala. And there are um, sex worker organizations in every province of the country, which is really unique. Um, and there's small local collectives um, that the sex workers are very much involved in and that work to um, improve their rights and also fight for recognition from the government. And they, um, all of the sex worker organizations that I spoke to in Ecuador took the position that they wanted the government to recognize prostitution as work. Um, and in both Argentina and Ecuador, uh, prostitution is not criminalized in that it's both legal to buy and sell sex. But in Argentina, brothels are illegal. And in Ecuador, brothels are legal and rec regulated by the government. So for my undergraduate research, I was looking more at what are the differences in conditions based on uh, different approaches to the legality of brothels and different spaces that sex workers can work in. So if you are interested in space at all, you can ask me about that later. Um, so some of my results, um, first of all, negative feelings that sex workers expressed. Um, a lot of sex workers expressed that they did not like selling sex to me. Um, most of them said they did it out of economic necessity and that they wanted to leave um, and eventually find another job. So some of the negative feelings that they expressed included uh, fear of violence from clients, as well as fear of violence from the police. Um, a lot of sex workers, particularly in Ecuador, had formerly gotten um, a lot of police abuse and violence, um, but that had improved over the past 10 years or so with uh, a lot of work from the organizations to improve the treatment of police and sen sensitize them. Uh, many expressed disgust towards having sex with many different men um, and towards their clients. So, um, for example, one sex worker, Alexandra, said, when I arrive at my house, I cry from sadness to know that how many men pass over me, how many men know my body, and how many men touch my body. Another said, uh, there are people who say it's the easy life, but it's not easy. It's not at all easy to sleep all the time and every day with different men. And this was something that came up multiple times, especially with the sex workers in lower income areas, um, bringing up that they found it a violation of their personal bodies to have to have sex with lots of different men who they were not attracted to, um, felt really disgust towards some of the men that they had sex with, um, and found it kind of a violation of their bodily intimacy. But that wasn't the case for every sex worker that I spoke with. And especially in more upper income areas, some emphasized that they actually sometimes had really enjoyable interactions with their clients or that um, they got to go to really nice places with them or that the treatment wasn't so bad or that they hadn't experienced very much violence. Um, so there was a wide diversity in responses. Um, many also emphasized to me, and uh, this came up again and again and is why um, I ultimately named my uh, dissertation It's Not Easy. Um, over and over again, sex workers said to me, this isn't easy. Or I, if I asked them, if, if there's one thing that you want people to know about this, what would you want them to, to know? And they say, sex work isn't easy. And this kind of implied that there's a societal belief that sex work is easy money, um, that women who sell sex are easy. And they wanted to emphasize that there are really a lot of challenges in this, um, that it wasn't a difficult, or that it wasn't an easy life. Um, but that shouldn't necessarily be taken to mean that they thought it was wrong or that they thought that prostitution shouldn't exist. Rather, I, f I saw it as um, a statement meant to challenge ideas about themselves and the discrimination that they tend to face uh, from people within society. And I think at the same time, it came along with an emphasis that this is a type of work that they are working and putting in effort and that they have to face a lot of challenges within their lives. So a few other quotes um, to share with you. 
one of them, um, Alfonsino, a male street-based sex worker in Buenos Aires, said, what I want most is to have a job and leave this because this is not, I don't like it. Sincerely, I do it out of necessity, you understand? Another, uh, Maria in Quito, said, before the police, they mistreated us a lot, they gassed us, the motorcycles came, they made us run, and them, how they have their uniform and everything, they have with the right to win, and then we are defeated. So in Quito, um, previously, there had been a lot of incidents of, of abuse by the police where, for instance, they would um, take them, they would round up the sex workers and take them far outside of the city and abandon them there and take away their cell phones or they would uh, force them to jump in the lake. Um, and even though sex work was not legal, they, uh, in this, the legislation surrounding street sex work is kind of in a gray area. There's not really any legislation saying it's legal or illegal. So previously there was a lot of police abuse of this um, and sex workers didn't fully understand what their rights were so they couldn't combat uh, the abuse that they were facing and the sex worker organizations have done a lot to let sex workers know what their rights are and uh, enable them to reclaim their rights to be on the street. Another sex worker um, told me about the discrimination they face from people within the society. So she said, we're discriminated against sometimes by people, by people who see you there, standing there in the corner, they look at you badly, they laugh at you. And this was something that many sex workers brought up as a challenge they face was discrimination just from people passing by, um, shouting names at them, or viewing them as dirty. Now, on the other hand, um, many sex workers also expressed positive feelings towards selling sex and told me about the benefits from it. So um, many emphasized that the income they earned from sex work was much higher than what they would be able to earn otherwise. And for those who were mothers, it was really important for them that this enabled them to provide for their children. Many said, um, this, the income that I've gotten from this has enabled me to buy a house or buy a car, send my children to school. Uh, and some of them in upper class areas even talked to me about how this enabled them to have higher levels of consumption or that they enjoyed some of the luxuries um, that they were able to get through clients, such as like going to nice hotels. Um, and especially for those who were independent sex workers, so not working in a brothel, but rather on the streets or independently indoors. Uh, it provided more flexibility and autonomy than wage work um, for, so that they could go and come as they pleased, which was really important for those who were mothers. And uh, this enabled them more flexibility to be able to care for their children and then work on their own time. So for example, um, one sex worker, Lucila, told me, you gain like if you had finished your studies like a university graduate and you work much less time because around here you're here all night, but you don't work. That is, you work one hour, two hours, and then you're done. Another said, uh, my son, thanks to God, is a world champion of martial arts, thanks to my work, you understand? Uh, so despite these sex workers not always having positive views towards selling sex or enjoying it, uh, they really felt grateful for the economic benefits that they could receive from it, and they emphasized to me the good that it had done in their lives. Um, so Elena said to me, so I work for my daughters, and because of my daughters, I feel good. I know it's not a job that I think any woman likes, but it's something where I earn money and I'm, how would you say it, independent. Um, on the other hand, some sex workers emphasized to me that they really did enjoy sex work, um, that it wasn't just kind of a, something they were doing out of necessity, but that they chose it actively uh, over other jobs available to them. So, um, for instance, one of the leaders of a uh, sex workers organization in Guayaquil said to me, I can learn to do beauty, paint nails, whatnot, do makeup, everything, but I don't like it. I like doing sex work. And another in Buenos Aires uh, said to me, it doesn't bother me at all. You're here because you want to. There's a ton of jobs to do. Logically, not just anyone can do this because it's not easier, but I like what I do. And then I looked afterwards at um, how the process of organizing had changed the way sex workers viewed themselves and their work uh, and altered their subjectivities. So I saw um, through the process of organizing and getting involved in activism, uh, sex workers developed a political identity and came to see themselves as citizens deserving of rights um, rather than simply shameful prostitutes or someone who should be ashamed of what they were doing. And they came to see themselves really as workers rather than um, as criminals as they had previously seen themselves. 
and um, sex workers' activism led to a lot of improvements in the conditions of sex work. Um, for instance, one of the organizations in, um, in Machala, Ecuador, had combated police abuse by documenting the police abuse on their cell phones. So when the police came and rounded them up and took them onto trucks um, and was going to drive them through the city to humiliate them and take them to jail, they recorded all of this um, by audio on their cell phones and then they got in touch with a uh, feminist nonprofit organization and threatened the police, like, we're going to expose you if you keep doing this. And that led to um, a major improvement in police conditions or a police treatment of the sex workers. Um, and another thing that they've done is like, a, a strike of national sex workers unions um, in which the brothel sex workers said to the brothel owners, we are not working anymore until you improve the conditions within the brothels. Uh, and that was really effective in Ecuador for getting the brothel owners to pay more attention to what the sex workers wanted. Uh, and so Elena Reynaga, who's the head of the uh, Latin American Sex Workers Organization Network based in Argentina and was formerly president of the Argentine Sex Workers Union, said to me, the only way to improve conditions for sex workers is to have organization of sex workers for sex workers. Because you, maybe we had rights, but we didn't know them, eh? We didn't know that the co constitution of our country is our constitution and what it says belongs to us and we have to claim it. We felt so guilty that we thought that really sex work was a crime and a sin. So this quote to me really uh, emphasizes the importance to sex workers, individual sex workers, of being able to organize themselves uh, because it transformed their views of themselves from criminals to citizens uh, and enabled them to speak up for themselves. So conclusions, um, I found through this that sex workers have a really diverse array of views about selling sex that are multidimensional and complex and often can seem contradicting um, but ultimately, when you look at their personal decisions, they make sense. So they may express negative feelings towards sex work, but ultimately they see the income that they gain from sex work as worth the sacrifice uh, and better than the other job options available to them, such as doing domestic work, for instance. Some told me, you know, I, I could be a maid, but I would make much less money. I wouldn't be able to choose my hours and the treatment from my employer might be just as abusive as my treatment here. Whereas here I make a lot of money and I can come and go when I want. Uh, so they operated within um, the previous model that I suggested, which is a constrained agency in which they made individual choices within the options that were available to them. Um, and I find from this that I think there ought to be a dual policy approach towards helping sex workers. So while most want to leave, I think that suggests that we need to be uh, working on providing additional economic opportunities to people in sex work so that those who do want to leave uh, can find another job that they see as suitable to them that enables them to survive. But at the same time, uh, we need to be uh, acknowledging sex workers' desire to have uh, prostitution recognized as work and improving the conditions within it. Uh, and my personal belief is that that requires decriminalization and treatment of prostitution as work. Um, and finally, that activism transformed sex workers' subjectivities, uh, enabled them to become empowered and see themselves as political subjects. Um, so thank you. Any questions?